call the meeting of September 10th of the South Brunswick Board of Education to order. Can you rise to salute the flag, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This being uh, September 10th uh, and uh, the day before, obviously the day before 9-11, it's also known now as Patriots Day. And I just want to read something and then we'll, I'm going to call for a moment of silence. Time is passing, yet for the United States of America, there will, will be no forgetting September the 11th. We will remember every rescuer who died in honor. We will remember every family that lives in grief. We will remember the fire and the ash, the last phone calls, the funerals and the children. We recognize the family members we've lost and you've lost with love. And uh, the South Brunswick victims that day in the Twin Towers are Jeffrey Robertson, he was 38, and he was from the Monmouth Junction section. Kenneth Loday, he was also 38, also from Monmouth Junction. Tanya Skinner, 27, she was from the Kingston section. And then there was a fourth person uh, who didn't live currently, uh, wasn't living in South Brunswick, but went to South Brunswick High School. And it's Mukil uh, Agawala. And he was 37 also. So I, I want to ask for a moment of silence for all that were lost, and especially the four people from South Brunswick. Thank you very much. I'm going to read the statement uh, of advance notice. The New Jersey Open Public Meeting Act was enacted to ensure the right of public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of public bodies at which any business affecting their interests is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of the act, the board secretary has caused notice of this meeting, including date, time, and location to be posted in the South Brunswick Public Library and the board office filed with the township clerk and communicated to the home news and star ledger. Mr. Pulaski, roll call, please. Mr. Patrick Del Piano, wave, you're here. He's here. Mr. Raymond Keener. Here. Mr. Mrs. Joyce Mehta. Here. Uh, Dr. Stephen Parker. Here. Mr. Devin Patel. Here. Mr. Arthur Robinson. Here. Mrs. Lisa Rogers. Here. Mr. Joseph Scaletti. Here. <laughs> Mr. Barry Nathanson. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Can I get a motion to approve the tonight's agenda, please? So moved. Moved by Dr. Parker. I have a second. 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 second by uh, Mr. Patel. All in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Thank you. Uh, Scott, you want to introduce our new student rep? I do. Okay. So night we have uh, a new student rep which we get uh, once or every two years and tonight it is Zoya Karam. Zoya do you want to introduce yourself and are you are you already prepared for a report or are we just saying hi tonight? I'm just going to be introducing myself tonight. All right go ahead. Yeah so um, I'm a rising senior at South Brunswick High School and I'm really excited to be given the opportunity to serve as the high school representative to the Board of Ed. I know how unique the situation right now is, and I'm looking forward to providing the student perspective 
and trying to help in any way that I can. So thank you for having me here. All right, welcome aboard. And uh, with that, before I start my report, I would like to turn it over to Jen Disler, who has some other important information regarding student representatives. I do, and welcome, Zoya. I've, I've gotten some nice information about you, and so she was very humble. I, I just also want to mention um, that, Zoya, you're a senior here, and um, you've spent the past three years um, as part of class council, and it's going to be for your first year on student council, I think. Um, you're vice president of the Viking Volunteers and the Law Club. She's got a lot of interest in politics, as I'm reading. Um, you're a member of the Model UN and the mock trial team. Your favorite subject is, I think, obviously, we could guess history. Um, and she loves baking, gardening, and painting. So I'm super excited that you're going to be, when we're back in person, sitting next to me, Zoya. So welcome. Um, and with that, I see out in our attendance, attendees um, that one Miss Tabitha is here with us today um, and uh, we're so glad that you joined us Tabitha uh, because we wanted to thank you. Um, Tabitha is also a senior and um, she decided that she was going to step down um, because she is the new student council president this year so she's got a busy job um, but I, I just want to say it's been a pleasure um, getting to sit next to Tabitha see her grow over the year. Um, she's become quite eloquent and um, very very much kept us in the know and um, articulate and it's neat to see our, our kids in this light because you can see in Tabitha that she's going to go on to do big and bright things. Um, so Tabitha, we thank you and I have this, I'm going to kind of show it up to the screen. You can see your name is engraved in this beautiful box and inside of it is um, your very own, I don't know how apropos this is for a kid of the millennial kids, um, but know that this is a, a pen for you to use. You might not be using it in your virtual instruction, um, but we're going to get this to you and this is just a little token of thanks from this whole board uh, to you for your service to, um, to, to our board meetings. Thank you for giving, our, giving, giving us your time um, and your dedication and Zoya, you have some big shoes to fill, um, but we know that you're going to be up for it, and, and we're equally excited that you're with us. So thanks, um, Mr. Fetter. Our virtual clapping for you, Zoya, and for you. <laughs> and, and Tabby. Thank you. Thank you. And Tabby, of course. All right. Um, so uh, you, heard, you heard Barry share a few uh, words about 9-11. I'm going to share some that's happening at the high school. I'm just going to read this so I don't mess up, but they're, they're doing some great things. So the, the phys ed department uh, and the Project Adventure Club are paying tribute to those who lost their lives on 9-11 by completing 1,980 stairs, equal a total of 110 stories, the same number as the World Trade Center. Students and staff at the high school will attempt to accomplish this during remote physical education classes on 9-11, so tomorrow. All students will participate however they are able, uh, uh, however they are able Dress for activity, wearing sneakers, staff and community members are encouraged to participate as well and post on social media using the hashtag, um, hashtag SB never forget and hashtag 911 memorial. They are also asking for online donations to Tuesday's children. Uh, they provide a lifetime of healing for those whose lives have been forever changed by traumatic loss. Tuesday children programming serves and supports our nation's families of the fallen builds resilience and common bonds in communities worldwide, recovering from tragedies, and keeps the promise to support all those impacted by 9-11. So again, a very nice tribute from our high school, our PE department, um, Project Adventure. So thank you guys for doing that, and I want to share that with our community. Um, so uh, now, now we're off. We have, <clears throat> today is the third day of um, this thing called the 2020-2021 school year. Um, I will give you my corny joke of the evening, and uh, we do have a silver lining that I must share. That is our theme for the year. I'm happy to report there were absolutely zero bus complaints for the first three days of school. That has never occurred before. <clears throat> In fact, we've never had an opening day of school without bus complaints. I will also add there was not one late bus, not one pickup, and all buses were on time at all of the stops they were asked to perform. So congratulations to Jill, our Director of Transportation. This is the absolute best first day we've ever had. So with that, um, I'm going to share how we're moving forward. So currently, we have um, all of our students on remote, and we do have our two remote learning centers housed at Greenbrook and Indian Fields. And those schools are about 110 kids. 
but we're kids are coming more and more every day. So we added three or four more today. We have another five more on Monday. And I think what's happening is people are realizing <clears throat> it's a nice option. And it's being run um, by uh, uh, Jen, Jenna Semigi and Jamie Bomer, our community education um, administration. They're basically acting as the two principals of those buildings. They have their secretarial support over there. We have our nurses over there. We have counselors over there. <clears throat> we have behavior supports over there. We have paraprofessionals. Our food service is working. It's a full day program. And so far, we are glad to report we have no incidences of any kind to really speak of. So that's what we want. We want to be able to say nothing. That's our goal, saying nothing. So we are happy to report nothing other than it's working and uh, we start moving kids in. Um, we are looking to move in some more students on September 21st. We're looking to move in students who are in our K through H self contained programs for autism and um, multiply disabled students um, who really do need to be in person. I mean, a lot of kids need to be in person, but we're starting at this next phase, part of our phase four, as you know. And um, we've asked parents to resubmit their surveys because we've changed it. Those are not going to be hybrid students, they're going to be full time, five days a week. We'll start those programs with four hour days for the first few weeks and then move them into full days. Want to ease everybody in. Um, we're excited about this. It's, it's, a, it's a good move for our, our kids. Uh, that's, what, that, that's what they really need. So we're going to continue looking at that and working with our reentry team. We have a meeting next week and continue to look at, uh, at how we're doing, uh, make adjustments. Um, I'll, I'll share a little bit about uh, what's going on with the remote learning. We've had some issues. You know, I'll be honest with you, remote learning has issues. Um, it has issues to begin with. But in the very beginning, we've had some tech issues. Um, we've had all kinds of little issues. In fact, we had over, over 150, I think, requests for Chromebooks over Labor Day weekend, which means that families just never got around to that um, and realized, well, we have school. So we're meeting all those obligations to our families and all that. I'll talk more about that in a little while. Uh, but the biggest um, kind of thing we had to deal with is what they call Zoom bombing. And Zoom bombing um, is when someone who should not be on a screen hops onto the screen and does something they shouldn't be doing. In this case, um, it's criminal activity, unfortunately. And the police are investigating <clears throat> a race, racial and sexual harassment um, that came on the screen. I can tell you um, when the students are found and the police are determined to find the students, whether they were our students or students from somewhere else or something else, um, they will be charged and they will be de dealt with both by the police as well as by the school district. So um, we have to ask that any type of behavior like this, we will not take lightly at all. Um, along with that, we are instituting changes to our programming. There are certain things that must be done uh, to avoid this, they're a little a little cumbersome, but we're going to take those next steps, and that'll be that'll be handled. I think Jen, is that being done? Yes. Yeah. As we speak, um, there might um, there'll be something going out to families. I would say tomorrow, if it hasn't already, staff are just in the know. Um, it's simple. It's just registering first. It'll help save a lot of things. It 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 might be a little bit cumbersome initially, but then nothing else will really feel different, but it'll put a nice safety precaution on for all um, to avoid any of this happening again. Yeah. Um, there, you might have heard of, of, of more um, nationwide issues with Google, nationwide issues with Zoom. The reality is the entire world started up at the same time. And as much as they were ready to handle all this, there were issues. So we have issues to work with. Um, also, just the programming in general. This is a lot of screen time. And it's a different kind of screen time than last year. So everyone has to adjust to that. And we also have to be open to making adjustments, not just adjusting to a decision, but making adjustments as we see the need. Mm -hmm. It's taking feedback from our students, taking feedback from our staff, and making adjustments. I mean, this is, um, this is a challenge. This is really tough stuff. And what our big, our big goal right now is not to lose education, not to lose the academic time. So that's kind of where we have to be. Um, and that's going to take adjusting. So I recalled for a reentry team for next week. Uh, that's uh, Ray Keener is our board of education. Say hi, Ray. Wave, Ray. Is our board of education representative. And uh, I think you probably, you already, you already respond, Ray. You coming? 
All right. You're on mute, but that's okay. I definitely will be there. Because saying you're on mute is the catchphrase of 2020. You're on mute should be, there should be, if there aren't already t-shirts, somebody make them and sell them because it's going to be a million dollar project. Um, David, let's get on that. Let's start becoming the, you're on mute salespeople. We can I'm make not on mute. I'm good. All right. Um, so anyway, the Zoom bombing is, is, not, is not funny. And again, they will be prosecuted. And uh, Jim Ryan, deputy chief, called me tonight, very aggravated. And that this is even, ha- that he even has to spend man hours on this, to be honest with you. And, um, but he has promised what he always does, a vigorous um, investigation to this. And again, I, the, the, the consequences both legally as and school are going to be quite significant. So um, hopefully I'll back to you soon with more information and uh, that this is over. Um, mostly we're ending it on our side by making the adjustments. Jennifer, uh, Pete Varela and Sharon Johnson have been working on that fix and we believe we're there. But I think as someone always says, you know, people that want to do bad, find ways to do bad. The, the trick here is to make it so people don't do bad, but we're, we're going to do our best to avoid, but hopefully people will realize it's not funny um, and uh, it's a problem. And it, again, we were not, believe me, we were not the only district. If you remember the swatting, if anyone remembers the term swatting, that is when people were calling in the bomb threats and doing all that and complete disruption. This is about on the same par, in my opinion. And that's, that's kind of what we're dealing with, a complete disruption of the education learning environment. So again, I know I'm belaboring it, but it's that serious. I want to make sure everyone knows that. Uh, I'm going to change gears and just talk about something we've been sharing with our community and our staff and uh, a lot of what's been happening regarding the school-based youth programs. Um, As you know, I've shared with the board as well as our community and our staff that in, in the governor's 2021 budget, it removes all funding out of the DCF budget for school-based youth service programs. Huge impact to South Brunswick. We currently um, have a contract provided with Rutgers for their bridge center, so for families. You know this as the bridge center at the high school and middle school. Extremely important program for mental health, supporting our students from a school-based program. The entire school-based youth program is cut for the entire state in the budget. That's the bad news. The good news is um, we've rallied some troops, working with other districts have rallied some troops. And I want to give a huge shout out to one of the groups that we are work with, which is the Garden State Coalition of Schools. And Betsy Ginsburg, she has not let up at all. And as of right now, Senator Ruiz, uh, Senator Oroho have all jumped on the bandwagon. Uh, Assemblyman Myla Jacy, um, uh, Assemblyman Zwicker. Jeffries, we are we have a lot of people who are battling this particular issue. This, this is a huge groundswell from the state on the loss of this on loss of these funds. We won't know um, until the end of September how the final budget turns out, um, and we need to keep moving. So um, we're hoping uh, there was a big uh, a, a big showing today for this. And we're hoping it does get overturned and that this gets put back in the budget. Um, as of right now, we, we lose half a million dollars in mental health direct. Just imagine this. A week before school starts, we are told by Trenton, you are going to lose half a million dollars of mental health support for kids. Now, I, I've never heard something more shameful from a government than to make a decision that would do such a thing. Now, again, we, we, we have to understand there's a lot of things, that, there's a budget issue, right? We can't say there's not a budget issue. There's no way to say everything that we're currently doing in the budget can continue. We have the same issue locally, right? We have the same issue. But mental health supports a week before school where we cannot even solve that with a half a million, we don't have half a million dollars and even finding the professionals, I mean, it, it's just very bad for us and about 100 other school districts. So right now we're dealing with it. We are looking at our funding to see what could be possible to restore as much as we can. But in the meantime, we're hoping the legislators that have now got involved, the coalitions that are involved, 
we'll get this overturned. If not, we literally will be out half a million dollars of mental health support come September 30th. And that's extremely upsetting uh, for all of us, uh, our bridge center, um, all of our mental health clinicians that work both for the district as well as for Rutgers, and our families and our, and our staff that count on these services. And again, I think the biggest difference here, if we never had the service, we would have always been budgeting differently. And if we even knew we weren't gonna have the service, we would have made other adjustments to try and do as much as we can. We would have been forced, and we will be forced at some point to make decisions to move money from one bucket to another bucket to cover this. But right now, we have to prioritize mental health of our students and our staff. It has to be prioritized. So come September 30th, we'll know more. But in the meantime, we're looking at what we can do just in case. We're not going to wait. We're trying to figure that out right now. Um, David is working on that. He's trying to free up some money in other ways so that we can make those decisions to support our kids. Doesn't mean we have no mental health supports. We do already have 140,000 invested in this program, which we will keep in that program. We're looking to see how high we can get the 140 up. Um, it's really important. So again, um, any of the any families who have questions, you wanna support, we have a whole website for this. Um, right now, I've sent the website out to the community. You can write letters. Uh, we have form letters already written to the different um, legislators. It's good to see that many of the legislators understand the damage this could do, and uh, it's nice to have them on our side. And they've reached out, and we've reached out, and um, we're all trying. So let's hope we get some good, good outcomes for that. Um, right, it leads me right into the next part. This is National Suicide Prevention Awareness Week, and we're talking about half a million dollars in cutting to mental health. It just kind of seems oxymoronic to me that we have the same same thing, but it is where we are. Um, so this week is National Suicide Prevention Awareness Week. Um, as part of the health curriculum, ninth graders will participate in signs of suicide during, during the health class and with the student assistance counselors. On opening day at the high school, all students were given information on school support staff and how to access their counselor, the nurse and administrators in regard. Counselors and administrators regularly train staff, so this is part of our protocols. We do that every year. Uh, there's a certain cycle that we go on for training on that. Um, we want to say, if, if anyone ever feels that their child needs to be seen for mental health, um, make sure you get in touch with immediate contact with the child's doctor and at least the school counselor so we can give you help. And again, this is not a cut to our school counselors. It's to the mental health clinicians from Rutgers in the Bridge Center. That's where the cut is. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to be doing a second annual suicide prevention awareness walk. It's being planned for the end of September and details will be on that shortly. So you'll hear about that. So again, don't, don't like to have to share that kind of stuff, um, but I wanna be honest with our public and keep our board abreast of um, where, where things are. So let me give you some other, I'll switch gears and we'll talk about something pretty positive. Obviously sports in general have been hammered over the last six months from the Olympics to um, baseball seasons, professional sports of all kind. Um, and then in high school sports last year, um, our entire spring season was canceled. So our kids lost all of that. So we have been looking at what we can do. So I'm gonna talk about middle school first. So middle school sports, we've come up with a plan. I can say we, but it won't be we. It is really um, Elaine McGrath, CJ Hendrickson, and the coaches and the administration of the middle and high school have been looking at what's possible. So in middle school, rather than having teams that won't have any other teams to generally play, because there's not many middle school teams out there left, and we're not looking to, in the middle school level, um, have teams travel at this point. So what we've created is an intramural program for all of the fall sports. We've opened up the um, um, application, the, the signups, it's already you know, getting hit pretty hard, which is what we want. Basically, we want kids on campus. Maybe we can't open up the schools right now, but we want kids on campus for whatever we can do. And outside is a safer environment, and it's something we want to do. So um, families have all received information. Intramural squads, instead of our football, we'll be playing flag football at the, at the middle school. And most of the other sports, you're able to make a sport out of it. Um, especially soccer will have seven on sevens, but you're able to do things to make a bunch of different teams have competitive little intramural sports league of our own. Woodbridge is doing something similar, but they have five middle schools and they can play each other. So for us, it's a little different. 
but uh, we're going to make it work. And again, a lot of kudos to all of coaches, CJ and Elaine and, and the administration over there for making this happen. So again, great for our kids to share along with that. Our clubs are happening and the signups are all coming for that. We're trying to get our kids to be as much involved as we can. You know why? Mental health. And that's the reality. Sports are a huge mental health support. Clubs, huge mental health support. And that's what our kids need, and that's what they're going to get. Let me move to the high school. So as you know, high school sports are going forward. Real teams, real happening. On the 14th, they start with practice up again. Right now, they're in their virtual mode. When that happens, we start playing. We start hitting in football. We start running near each other and all of those things. The NJSIAA has put out guidelines. And the one thing I want to talk to you about is fans at football games. Now, there are some interesting rules on fans at football games. Uh, the most interesting rule, I think, is if you all remember, there currently is an executive order that you cannot have more than 500 people outside at a gathering. That is the current executive order. Well, except for football, where all of a sudden football doesn't seem to fall under the executive order rules. So I'm not sure what the science is exactly on that, but that is the, that's what it is. So let me explain the rules. So for fans, you don't count the players, the coaches, the umpires, and you don't have to count your marching band. So for us, if you counted both teams of the 70-person team on both sides and all the players, the coaches, and all the da-da-da, and then our 180-person marching band, which is about the size some years, we'd have 360 players that none of them have to count then we can still have 500 people, which makes our new um, fan base, 860 people can now gather for a football game. I, I'm good at math, but this is the math problem I have yet to figure out how to solve. Anyway, with that said, marching band is virtual this year. So marching band, uh, there'll be pet bands at our games, but no one's allowed to travel to other games. We only have six games, three at home, three away. The fans were looking to give each student would have two tickets. We're also looking to give the um, uh, pet band members would be about 40. Cheerleaders, about 25 will get two tickets. Players will get two tickets. Coach gets tickets. Coach gets to have some tickets too. Um, the uh, student council gets 50 tickets. So basically we're looking at this and how we can still manage this. But here's my word of warning to any football fans, uh, parents, students that might be listening tonight. And I say this with love and respect. If people do not follow the rules, there will only be one game with fans. That will be the first game. We will shut that down in a heartbeat. Those rules are masks and social distancing, period. That's it. As long as we do that, we can keep going. And I, I know I feel, I guess this is when I get my ogreish mode, but I really have to say it as emphatically as I did because I'm not, I'm, it's not a threat. It's 100% guarantee. If we cannot manage that many people, we cannot do it again. We don't have enough time to get better at it. This is just the kind of thing. So we want people to watch their kids and watch their team play, but it has to be done safely. So with that said, um, uh, Elaine McGrath is going to hold a meeting with varsity parents <laughs> so that they can hear that more directly as well if they're not listening tonight. Uh, we want all three games. We want fans. We want this to be great for our kids. This is a, this is a, it's a cultural event <laughs> uh, in, in high school, and we really want to value that. Um, other, other sports, <clears throat> two sports have been removed from this season and move to a later season, and that is volleyball and gymnastics. So, but again, the fans is the new information, and we wanted to share that with you so the board knew. And when I'm finished, if there are any questions from the board members, of course, just chime in. But let me just get through this. I, I, I'm sorry, I have a long one tonight, uh, Mr. Nathanson. Um, just so we, we can say, uh, free and reduced lunch information, still, if you still need food, please get in touch with us. We are doing our deliveries. We are at the schools. It's important to make sure all of our kids are getting fed. So that's an important one, just to remind people of that. Um, da, 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 da. Let me talk about um, 
couple of other things here. What I want to talk about is Chromebooks. I'm going to give you some crazy numbers. And um, so about a month ago, if you remember, I sent out a donation form. And thank goodness I did because we've received $9,000 from people that have donated money for Chromebooks. That will buy us um, about 40, maybe 45 brand new Chromebooks, which we are, <laughs> a month ago, when we sent out the letter on that, we had a bunch of questions about, about that. And I, it's very hard to explain the whole thing, but I'm gonna try my best to give the board a full understanding of what's going on um, with our finances when it comes to a few different topics. So one, with Chromebooks, there was the initial money given out by the federal government called CARES Act money. We received $329,000. Now that had a wide use that you could spend that on. Sharon Johnson, our director of um, technology, she understood if we did not put an order in for Chromebooks at that moment in time, we just weren't gonna get them, period. And that's exactly what happened to many districts. They are on back order for months to get Chromebooks. There are districts right now waiting for their orders. So when we saw that we were getting different monies, we put the order in immediately, thank goodness, and we bought our Chromebooks. Well, those Chromebooks have been eaten up. At that time, we had about a thousand requests for Chromebooks. As of today, we've given out 2,239 Chromebooks at about $200 a Chromebook. We have 8,500 students. We are currently into our reserves. We no longer have new Chromebooks to give out. Sharon is looking to spend the 9,000 on the next set of Chromebooks, and she's very concerned because she doesn't know when they're gonna come. So she's gonna order them, and we hope we get them soon. So we are currently into our reserve Chromebooks, and while we still have those, remember, they're a year or more older, and with that becomes more problems as they're going, you know, when kids are having them at home, it's very different than when they're here. We also have 110 kids coming in and soon we'll have more kids coming in. One of our biggest concerns is when we go to hybrid, how many families did not ask for a Chromebook because when they're home, they don't have to worry about that. They have either their home situation or maybe a too expensive an item, they don't want their third grader to bring in a very expensive item. So we are now expecting another rush on Chromebooks again when we go hybrid. So as soon as we announce hybrid, we're expecting that. The other issue we have right now is we have to still be prepared for NJSLA testing. When that comes in, all of those Chromebooks have to be set up and prepared for that. That means we need a different set of Chromebooks. Now we have other Chromebooks that we're sitting right now because we, we can't give them all out. So right now, the people that need them, remember 8,500 kids, we've given out a little less than 25%. That is saying our community has stepped up huge because if we've only given out 2,200, that means the other six plus thousand have taken it upon themselves to outfit their own child. And we appreciate that more than you know, because if we run out of Chromebooks, we have a big problem. So we are gonna build back up our base as things break. We already have two broken screens, <laughs> three days, two broken screens. That's part of the insurance plan. We self-insure plus a $15 insurance plan for certain things that we paid to the company. So this is just very expensive proposition. The other part of this, is 47 MyFi's have been given out. That gives to families that do not have internet access at home. Now those MyFi's are directly connected to one computer that we give out. So that MyFi can't be used on any other computer. If a family has multiple needs, multiple children that we've given multiple computers to, it gets hooked up to all of those computers in one home. Now we pay for that monthly, and we pay for it uh, for the machine itself. Again, another expensive proposition. So I wanna explain a little bit more about the, now, I, now I'm not announcing the names of all of the donors, but again, part of what, what has been occurring, we, I cannot tell you how many emails we receive from people or phone calls requesting how they could help, how they could do that. We originally created that document as a 
kind of a response to the people asking who wanted to do good in the community. Well, at that time, we were looking at our, our number of people requesting, looking at what we were able to purchase. And we kind of like, well, we have, we're in good shape. We're in good shape. I wish I never sent out the second letter because we're, we can always use. But at this point, we're doing fine. And every child that needs one has a computer. And any child that has asked for internet access has it. What we do now is the teachers are your next line of defense. They now look and see, are there any kids not logging on? Are there any kids who are not showing up? Are there any kids with such, such spotty technology that we might need to intervene? That's why all of these things matter. Some kids are having issues with their cameras. Some kids have issues with their sound. Some kids have issues with just the age of their computer that they're using. That's why we still need our reserves and we want these next 45 or 50 new machines so that we can give those machines out to these kids. Again, they might not come in for a month or two months. So in the meantime, we'll be giving out our reserves to do that, which we've already started doing. But after we got the CARES money, and after spending over $370,000 on PPE for the district, the governor announced another initiative called Digital Divide. Now, we've just been told, finally, that you are, we are being awarded money, half a million dollars, to, again, purchase things like technology. For us, we're looking at the funding we received the CARES Act money will probably go to the PPE. The digital divide money will go to the computers and the MiFi's that we purchased so that we can balance this budget without going more broke than we already feel like we are some days. So this is a very, very intricate thing. That's what David gets paid to do. David's the guru of this and he'll figure out whatever is allowed to happen, how to make it happen. But we need to make sure we keep our kids safe and we keep our kids in technology. So again, for the families that donated, $9,000 is going to go a long way. We thank you for that. The MiFi's alone cost $300 a year just for the MiFi's. So with 50 of those out already, just do the math, big money. So to keep going with transparency for the public, we deal with backups. We have to deal with breakage. Um, and it just, it's a lot. I have to thank David in advance and Sharon Johnson for figuring out how to make all of this happen. Because then what happens is what I shared with you before. On top of all this, what happens? We lose $500,000 we have to replace somehow for mental health. This is what keeps me up at night, is how to make sure we're keeping kids safe and keeping the kids in technology. And I gotta be honest with you, for my other 28 years of, of education, those two things, were just commonplace. We always kept kids safe, but never did we have to devote $375,000 for that. Never did we have to devote so much money to the technology. Plus, I didn't even tell you, we had to spend about $200,000 more out of one of these accounts, Digital Divide, PPE, um, CARES Act, I don't know, wherever, David figures it out. That was on technology infrastructure so that when kids come back to school, we can handle the one-to-one -one of having all these new devices. If you're not familiar with IT, you need bandwidth. You need the ability to actually have computers talk to each other and talk to the internet. So Sharon's been working on building up that infrastructure as well. Right now, it's been, it's been, it's been quite a ride, but um, we think we're in a good place um, the, the, the 50 new Chromebooks that Sharon will put on order is go, are going to go a long way. And so far, thanks to David and um, our business office, we'll be able to get through all this. But it is tough. On another donation note, um, we have another group to acknowledge, B. Jana. They've donated and they've taken this upon themselves um, in a mask and face shield initiative where they've donated 200 masks and face shields to the district. Now, some people might even complain, well, why would you ask for something if you have Chromebooks? Why would you ask for masks if you already have masks? The reality is we have a very giving community and people like to do things for others. We like to support when people want to do things. Imagine if I told the mask, the kids were making masks, no, thank you, we've already bought masks. We don't want your masks. Imagine what message that would be. When we needed Chromebooks, 
And we know we're going to, we see, we know our situation. And it's a challenging situation dealing with what we understand about the way people need. So we are very thankful to all of our donors for this. And we just can't say enough for these kids that went out of their way. And they're really cool masks. And the face shields are going to go a long way. So again, it's wonderful. We live in a great community and very happy about that. Uh, I'm going to stop because I can keep talking forever, as you know. But our next board meeting is Thursday, September 24th at 7 p.m. And at that meeting, please come back because we're going to recognize our 2019 and 2020 educator and education support persons. We don't get to do that last year. Had this whole COVID thing happen. So we want to try and bring us back there and, and do these positive experiences and honor our amazing staff as well. So before we move on, uh, Mr. Davidson, I'll open up to the board if they have any questions. Please, anyone have any questions? Uh, I don't think so, Scott. Yeah, you got Lisa. Oh, uh, Lisa. Come on, you know me better. Of course. <laughs> I should have just called on you, Lisa. That's what. Great. <laughs> um, Scott, just two quickie questions. Um, regarding the football game, since there's going to be a limit to who can attend, are we considering possibly recording or providing, not recording, but providing it on uh, YouTube or some type of uh, streaming so that the town can watch if that's possible? And then I have another question. Uh, I'll check into that. I'm not sure. I'll, I will check in. Good question. Okay, and then the last one has to do with technology. You had mentioned, obviously, we you were really not at the one-to-one -one point yet, but hopefully we will soon be. When we are there, are, do we still have a gap when it comes to NJSLA testing, or will the students that have one-to-one -one be using their same devices, or are we gonna need more? Yeah, I think, I think right now we'd be set if no one else needed another computer. <laughs> Like if we get no more requests with the 50 new ones we'll buy from the donations, we would probably be okay with NJSLA right now. <clears throat> if we have to eat into the reserves, which are all the ones on carts and the ones that have always been used in the buildings could eventually become a bit of a problem. So we're trying to figure that out actually. So we, we're not a hundred percent sure, mm. um, but the idea of kids bringing their computers back and forth to school with NJSLA testing, we have to see how tight the, um, the system is. So Suzanne and Suzanne Luckborn and Sharon and Jen will be looking into that to make sure if we have to go out and purchase more Chromebooks right now, uh, that's a problem. Like we really okay. can't get another giant order of Chromebooks right now. Right. Okay. Thank fun. you. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Parker. This is a follow up to that. So when you're doing this testing, the kids will have to be using school computers. They can't use it on their own device. So, Steve, what, what I'm saying is we're trying to figure this part out. We've never been in this position, but generally you'd hope that we'd be able to lock down the browser for the testing and that, the, and that these computers will be able to handle that. The issue you have is once kids start bringing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, it's hard to make sure we've stabilized the computers. You can't have glitches on that day. So even if they're available to be used, it could be required that we have to take them and leave them in the school for that period of time so that they don't go back and forth. So it might not be a matter of can we use those computers, it's a question of how to do it safely. Not that kids could, could cheat or anything like that, just you can't have the computer breaking down in the middle of testing. So when we get ready for testing, it's a, it's a and Sharon Johnson's, you know, right now this is the craziest she's ever probably been. The tech support needed right now has been absolutely crazy. But when it comes to NJSLA testing, that's when a lot of this becomes and our techs become very important to making sure we're secure and that the machines are ready. So we're used to just having the machines available right in front of us. If kids are using them and going back and forth to school with them, it's a little bit more of a risk that we haven't dealt with yet. We'll, we'll reach out to other districts that have and we'll make sure we're good. But right now having a supply, even though they're older Chromebooks, to be available that we know are good for NJLSA is probably a very good thing for the first year of this. If I could add to Scott, we don't even yeah. know about if what what testing will look like. So amongst this whole COVID environment, we we still will wait from guidance from the state if it's going to happen. As you all know, it it didn't happen last spring. So the unknowns make it something we want to be. It's kind of like um, David was describing um, our situation with with various other parts of the district. 
we want to make sure when it's time to, to do something that we're not stuck behind the eight ball. We want to be very prepared. And this is all new to us. So um, we just want to be, we want to make sure we take care of our kids and we don't want our kids to suffer because we weren't prepared. Any other questions? All right, Mr. Nathanson, turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that extensive report. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I think we're opening opening school. So we sh should we call you Shrek from now on since you're an, you're an ogre or what? Well, I, I had to be. I apologize, but uh, you know. Okay, that's okay. So uh, moving along uh, to recognition of calendar art uh, students, uh, Jen Desler, please. Yeah, I'm just sharing my screen with you all. Um, so I think us not being um, in person, one thing that you would have noticed a lot of our attendees tonight are families and student artists. Um, so it's always nice to know that we have students in our audience and um, you would have had a room full of folks tonight, I think in support of this recognition. And so um, thank you for being so patient guys. You got to hear some good information from Mr. Fetter. And so I'm glad the families got to hear that. And, and now this is the part of the night that we get to honor all of you. And um, what you're looking at right now on the screen is a glimpse at the cover of our 2021 um, district calendar. And um, they are actually um, have just um, been delivered and they will get delivered to schools tomorrow so that they can be disseminated when students pick up supplies. And, um, you know, it, it's always that battle of do we have paper or not. And I have to tell you that there are pros, pros and cons to both. But when you see this beautiful artwork amongst amongst this calendar, you can't help but just smile and know that it's worth it. Um, just so you all know the calendar, we did a couple adjustments to the paper calendar this year. Um, we only put the dates in there for school closings. We made um, some adjustments in some rooms so that families can put their own notes and, and dates in there as well. Um, it also includes all of the information, almost like a how-to and mandates and all those kinds of things that are in there. So it's chock full of good information. Um, but we're here tonight to, to honor our students and the beautiful artwork in it. Um, Scott mentioned earlier that this is our, our um, theme for this year and that there's always a silver lining. And I have to say that a silver lining out of COVID in the spring was that even in that time, our art teachers who are also all in the audience here tonight, they found a way to pick um, beautiful art pieces to honor their students and still get get beautiful works of art produced by students even in time of COVID. So I, I consider that a silver lining. And um, I, like I said, our, our art teachers are here tonight, and I, I'll recognize each one of them as I recognize students. Um, but they they have you know they've managed to be able to continue to um, inspire and develop our students in this area. And when we talk about mental health, um, it's it's so important that we um, have a well balance of academics and and other interests and fine arts are one of them. And and so um, our art teachers have really gone out of their way to make sure that there's still an opportunity for our kids to be creative. Um, and I, I challenge them, I'm, I'm pl putting this little plug in, that I challenge them and, and our um, supervisors who are both here tonight too, um, to think about how do, we, how do we do it this year? How, how do we do an art show? Can we do something virtually? What will our calendar look like? Um, so I know that there's great ideas. And so I'm excited to hear what they're thinking and excited to be able to um, you know, look at and be creative and find our silver linings this year. Um, for art to continue. Before we honor our students, I do just want to give a couple shout outs and thank yous. And like I mentioned, we're going to talk and call up call introduce each of our student artists in a moment but all of our art teachers they've all been invited tonight and are joining and they're part of the attendees um, if we were in person right now I'd have them stand up and wave but like I said each one of them I'll announce when when we um, introduce each child uh, but their supervisors are also here tonight Kristen Laskin is a supervisor for um, grades the high school and she works with the art teachers there amongst many other things that she supervises as well as Blair Eisman 
she is the supervisor for the art teachers in grades K through eight. Um, so I thank you both for joining us tonight and for all of your help in helping our teachers get this great artwork and getting the calendar put together. Speaking of the calendar put together, I give a shout out and a thank you to Elizabeth Williams. She's my secretary and um, she single-handedly um, makes sure that this book is perfect. Um, she has folks that help her look it over, um, but I put the pressure on her and she always does a fine job. So thank you to her, as well as some of our sponsors. Master Graphics is who we utilize to print, um, but PNC Bank always gives us a contribution each year to support um, the cost of this to, to make it not be so much for the district. So again, a shout out to, to, to all of them. And I also say thank you to our board for always supporting um, the efforts of the calendar and, and also a shout out to our administration. Um, you guys are all here tonight to support your student artists. And so I saw your names in the attendee list. It's funny, I usually can just look out and see you all. Um, but I, I saw your name. So thank you for being here. And, and it's important um, because I don't think you guys can see the attendance list. So student artists, I want you to know that you have your teachers here, you have your principals here um, to uh, give you virtual claps. And um, I'm so glad that even though we are uh, doing this virtually, that we are taking the time to honor, honor you all tonight. So with that said, I think we're ready to get started. Um, the calendar itself, we'll go through it month by month. There is artwork on every page. This year, Scott, I didn't put your mug up on the, on the screen because we adjusted a little bit. So you're actually not Mr. September anymore. You've, you've moved from that spot, I'm sorry. Um, but we're gonna start with the cover art. And um, the first honoree, and so, what I want to do is tell you a little bit about the honoree and let you look at this gorgeous work up close. And um, this, this artwork is from Catherine uh, Shang, and her teacher is Lori Boodoo. And this year, um, Catherine is in 11th grade. Um, this was done when she, uh, the year prior. So you'll, everybody there, I listed their current grades, but obviously it's all from the year before. And um, this beautiful artwork is part of our cover. So a big shout out to Catherine. Um, please know all of the attendees, will, we will be mailing home to you a certificate um, to thank you as well as a, another calendar. You'll get your own special copy of the calendar mailed to your house. Um, so that'll be coming um, next week to you all. So virtual clap for Catherine. Also on our cover is um, Lakshmi. Um, Katapali, and this year um, Lakshmi is in 10th grade, um, but this was done when she was in ninth grade, and Kim, Col Kim Coleman is her art teacher, um, so you can see this beautiful artwork. Um, we, we try to put, is, any of the ones that were in color, we put try to show you so you can see the color artwork. When we print them, we, we, we do them in black and white, um, so congratulations to Lakshmi. Also on the cover, um, another one, we have six pictures all together. Um, this is Ashley um, Roxbog, and Ashley is now a senior. This was done last year as a junior. Uh, Katie McMillan is her teacher, was her teacher last year, and this was chosen um, to represent that class. And so awesome, beautiful uh, job, Ashley. We can't wait to send you your own copy of your calendar. So a ha shout out and a hand clap to Ashley. Gorgeous, right? I'm, I'm, I'm so envious of, do I say this every year, Scott? I think I do, that I don't, I don't feel like I have an artistic bone in my body. And I think the art teachers would yell at me right now because they would say that everybody can do it. But I don't think to the level of, of these guys. Um, another piece of our cover art, this gorgeous um, artwork by Serena Say Chaloon. Um, she's a, now a junior, and this was done when she was in 10th grade, and Rebecca Bufus uh, is her teacher. I had the luxury of being in one of Rebecca's class last year. It was neat to just see the kids work and, and do their thing. Um, so this beautiful, beautiful flower is part of our cover art. Um, so congratulations to you, Serena. All right. So another pretty cool, pretty cool picture here, right? Isn't it amazing? I see Lisa doing this. I know, right? 
Um, so this is by um, Prisha Agarwal, and um, Prisha is in 10th grade. So she did this as a ninth grader, and uh, Lori Boodoo uh, was her teacher last year. Um, so another high school um, piece of art that is part of the cover of this year's calendar. Um, I think each one gets better, it gets better every year, and um, these kids are so amazing. And um, finally, our last but not least piece of artwork on the cover is um, by Joseph. So we get, a, we get some guys in here. Joseph Carlson. Um, Norman Chow is the art teacher. And, and now um, Joseph Joe is in 12th grade. But he did this as a junior in Norman's class. Um, so kudos to you, Joe. And um, you'll be getting your certificate and your calendar. Um, but gorgeous, gorgeous work. Um, and a shout out to the high school teachers. Thank you for producing such wonderful work and being inspirational to our kids. Um, so now I'm going to move into the calendar, calendar itself. Um, month by month, we have a different artist that represents that month, and their work is um, highlighted. So we start with the month of September. And for September, it's one of our Crossroads students. This is a student out of Crossroad North. It's Amaya Foster. Um, the art teacher at Crossroads North is David Castaldo. And um, it says here, as you see, uh, ninth grade. That's her current year. Um, so she did it as an eighth grader at Crossroads North. Um, beautiful detail to this artwork. And um, so gorgeous job, Amaya. And, and like I said, thank you. And you'll be getting your calendar and, and certificate. October this year is one Maria Beshai, and she's a student at Indian, Indian Fields. Um, she did this as a fourth grader, and um, now currently in fifth grade there, her art teacher, is he's new to our bunch. Um, this is Jason um, Chiselle, and uh, we, we um, give him a nice round of applause and a warm welcome because this is his first um, scene uh, in the art gallery and part of the um, calendar art. So welcome, and you can see that he's already producing some great art from his students. And uh, Maria, awesome job. This is our October picture. For November, look at this little thing. Oh my goodness. Um, so this is Anvita um, Sajankila, and she is a Dean's student, um, a part of Brooks Crossing School. And um, she, her art teacher is Ellen Kazar, and um, she's in first grade this year, but this was done as a kindergartner. Um, look at this beautiful artwork of this tree. So this is part of our calendar and will always be a nice memory um, for Envita and her family. So that's November. December, my goodness. Um, this again is out of Crossroads North. David Castaldo is the teacher. Um, Defan Lee um, did this, this beautiful, this be I wanna say photo, it almost looks like a photo, it's gorgeous. Um, student is an eighth grader now, did this as a seventh grader. Um, so it's gonna be neat to see what this student continues to do. Great job, Defan. So that's our December. January, um, very fitting, this bear has his winter sweater on. Um, Nyetha Krishna is a Greenbrook student and um, the teacher there is uh, Jen Kipnis. Um, Nyetha is currently in third grade. She did this as a second grader and um, this, this beautiful artwork will live um, in this calendar and um, thank you for sharing it with us. Awesome to Nyetha. We're on to February. Let's see what February has in stall. So amazing. Um, this is our Crossroads South, um, one of our student artists there, Tanishi Meiti. Um, this is, uh, she's in eighth grade currently. And um, so done as a seventh grader. Tracy Dovis is the teacher at Crossroads South. Um, big shout out to her and to this student, Taishi, Tanishi. Um, you know, this is a favorite book of mine and a favorite movie. I'm sure there's a lot of you out there that like The Hunger Games. Um, what, a, what a great, great um, piece of artwork. So congratulations to you. I do have to say it's weird not being able to see you all, I have to say. Um, okay, March. Beautiful flowers for March. Um, Leia. Raj Kumar, 
Brooks Crossing student. And um, our Brooks Crossing student is now in fourth grade. She did this as a third grader. Again, um, the art teacher at Brooks Crossing and Deans is Ellen Kazar. Um, and just what beautiful work is coming out of these schools. Gorgeous, beautiful job, Leah. That's my birthday month too. And I think that's one of my favorite ones. Uh, April, we have to have a bunny rabbit in April. Um, Batul Kapadia. Um, Brunswick Acres student this year in third grade. She did this as a second grader. Um, art teacher over at Brunswick Acres is Suzanne Tiedemann and um, just what a gorgeous job and um, very inspirational and what detail for a second grader to do in, in artwork. So awesome, awesome job, a tool. Going on to May. You're not going to want to flip your calendar each month. You're going to want to leave it up for all of this. Um, May is a month of hope and just beautiful, beautifully done. This is Owen Alzuski. And Tracy um, Kachalik is the teacher over at Constable Elementary School. She's the art teacher there. This student did this as a third grader. Uh, he's now a fourth grader over at Constable. And I think a great message um, for us all. Good job, Owen. We move into June, and June is Sophia um, Kaidonius, a Cambridge student. She's now in sixth grade. She's now in the middle school, but did this as a fifth grader. Um, Kristen Mallon is the art teacher over there. Kudos to her and to Sophia. What a beautiful job, um, beautiful landscape, and nice detail. I see the little people in the house, which is awesome. So great, great work. I love that you're all seeing it in color. Look at that sky. We move into July, and this is um, Jack Whitlock, a Mammoth Junction student did this. So this is an elementary student. Um, he's now in sixth grade. Uh, he did this as a fifth grader. Jill Ward is the teacher um, at Mammoth Junction uh, Elementary School. Kudos to Jack. What a, what a great, it's, you see it in the eyes there of that uh, drawing. Beautiful job. So that's July. And um, August, Melanie Paredes Gonzalez. She's a Crossroads South student, um, rendition of one of my favorite candies, I have to say. She's now a ninth grader. She's now in the high school. Um, but this was done as an eighth grader. The detail on this is gorgeous. Um, art teacher Tracy Dovis um, over at Crossroads South. Um, kudos to you, Melanie. What a beautiful job. And finally, we actually have a page in our in our our calendar. There's just more information. So we call it page 26. And so that comes right after our August. And so our page 26 artist is this little cutie, um, Swara Chinthampadla. And um, Swara is an Indian Fields student. And um, she's at Dayton. This is when she was done at Dayton, which is part of Indian, Indian Fields. Um, this was done when she, Suara was in just kindergarten. And she's now a big first grader. And this gorgeous piece of artwork has lots of color. And it just makes me happy. I hope it makes you happy. Um, all of our students have their artwork with them. So we were able to take pictures, but let them keep it in their possession. Um, so may, may it always be a... Um, a memory for you. Let it um, keep a good place in your heart to know that you have this love for art and that you're being recognized for your creativity. Um, to our art teachers, thanks for inspiring our kids. Please continue to do so. Uh, this is something we look forward to every year. And um, I, can't, I can't thank you all enough for the time and effort that you put in. Um, to our art students, keep keep doing, keep being creative. Um, I can't wait to see what comes out of this year. Um, there's been some great creativity while we're, while we've been in remote. And um, I just look forward to seeing more art. And um, I thank you all for coming. Um, your certificates and calendars are in the mail. And I turn it back over to you, um, Mr. Nathanson. Thank you for giving me the time tonight to share this awesome artwork. Thanks, Jen. You know, it's always good to to see uh, the calendar work, but it's it's a little uh, heartbreaking that, like you said, we're not there. You know, one, one of the best part of being a school board member is these nights where we get to see the students and get to shake their hands. So thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. 
Moving along, uh, we're going to move to the public comment, and I'm going to read the uh, public comment statement. The Board of Education recognizes the value of public comment on educational issues and the importance of allowing members of the public to express themselves on school matters of community interest. Complete copies of the rules that govern this portion of the meetings can be attained in advance copy by contacting the board office during regular business hours. We reserve the right to limit each speaker to no more than three minutes. It is our plan to listen to each member of the public. We will note all questions and comments made. Once all questions and comments from all members of the public are made, the Board of Education will respond if necessary to questions or comments in the most timely and efficient manner available. Please consider not repeating comments and questions made by other members of the public. I ask that you state your name, place of residence, and or your group affiliation. Uh, Mr. Pulaski, do we have anyone that have signed up to speak? We do. We have two uh, community members. One has a hand up, Akash Kanan, and um, Judith Walters, I believe, um, reached out to want to speak, uh, maybe to you, Barry, but she's, Correct. she's here tonight. She just needs to raise her hand. So let's get Akash Kanan. Hello, my name is Akash Kanan, and I am a member of the South Brunswick High School class of 2018 and a member of the Ryder University class of 2022, majoring in information systems and minoring in business analytics. I'm from Monmouth Junction, New Jersey. I live right across from South Brunswick High School. I would like to tell you my suggestions. My suggestion is to probably open up preschools to not only special needs kids and limited amount of general education kids and low income kids. What I would have to say is this should be high quality preschool because research shows people who attend high quality preschools do well in college, in high school, and have better employment outcomes. And also, this will help our district become not only top three, but in top 1%. And coming up with programs such as Ready for Kindergarten programs for infants to age five or age six will help people be ready for kindergarten, help people to do well, irrespective of the cutoff date. I hope all of you guys take this into consideration and I applaud all of you for being here and taking the time to appreciate me. This is from Akash Kanan. I love you all. Thanks, Akash. Thank you, Akash. Uh, our next speaker, I don't see Judith with a hand up if she wants to speak. Judy Walters. I'm not sure if she wants, she didn't reach out to me personally. Uh, I've got Christine. Christine wants to talk. Okay. Go ahead, Christine. I had to unmute. Um, hi, Chris Resnick from Kendall Park. Um, I just wanted to um, say to all of you, and I'm going to read this because I won't forget my, I'll forget my thoughts. Um, being prepared with the backup devices in case of breakage or personal devices no longer being available um, is something, in my opinion, that's a very responsible thing for the district to do. Um, having the devices on hand prior to students needing them uh, would, in my opinion, also um, limit a lapse in learning for the student in need. So um, I just wanted to say that due to the budget cuts, um, with the district being short on funds. Um, I wanted to thank those who have already donated towards this very important um, piece of um, education now in, in these days. And um, I just wanted to thank all those, those people for um, being so generous and encourage more families to join them. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, anybody else interested in speaking, please raise your hand, which is, it, it's on the bottom. Uh, uh, 
David can't acknowledge you. Judy huh? Walters wants to speak. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, it wasn't working. <laughs> I'm not very good with technology myself. Um, so you guys all pretty much either know of me or heard of me, but very briefly for the community, I'm a 28 year community member and both my girls went through this extremely awesome school district where they got fabulous educations and went on to great colleges and are now in wonderful careers. So I thank South Brunswick. I was also a very active volunteer as they were growing up and I do understand quite a bit about how everything works. So I want to say that um, I am very perplexed by what has happened with the Chromebooks and the whole initiative. Um, I appreciate that Scott said before that he wants to be very transparent and feels that he has. I think that's great, but I think that there is a lack of transparency, or for me at least, I'm not seeing clarity. Um, I'm a writer by trade, and so words are everything to me. So when I first saw the first letter that the South Brunswick School District wrote about needing Chromebooks, it said, due to significant budgetary cuts, we are unable to provide devices to every student in the district. I asked Barry, who I've been friendly with for many years, um, you know, how much money was needed and how many Chromebooks were needed because I, and I told him this, he asked me, and I told him the reason why is I thought that you would get more money and more, therefore more Chromebooks if you were out front with the district about with the with the families about what you needed and he said okay yeah that makes sense and so about a half an hour later uh, this was on august 21st i got dr fetter's second mr fetter's second letter and in this one he says while we have purchased the computers needed at this time with money from the federal cares act having extras available for families that need them is always wise we are in good shape at this moment but want to make sure we stay flush so no child is without so that's a total, totally different statement than the first statement. The first statement was, we need these computers. The second statement only just hours later is, we don't, we, we don't really need these computers at this time. So meanwhile, all these, le these letters are circulating to families and to, you know, on community Facebook, community Facebook groups. And my husband and I, our first reaction was we were going to give money. We always support the schools. We have for all of our years and will continue to, even without children in the schools. And um, I was really confused by this and with both letters. I then asked over a period of several days, a number of questions of Barry on, um, on direct messenger from Facebook about kind of what was going on, why wasn't the money being returned if you guys have enough money, uh, how much money was being collected. Like, I didn't really understand anything. And, and then I started having a conversation. I emailed Scott and did not hear back for six days. And I just want to say for the record, I understand you guys have a whole lot going on. Totally respect that the school district is doing everything it can right now. And this probably seems like not a big deal. But to me, it's a big deal. So for six days, I didn't hear from him. And then I asked Barry, and within just a few minutes after I asked Barry, Scott did write back to me. We had kind of a tense exchange back and forth. And one of the reasons why was because um, I was looking for the money to be returned. And so we won't go there because I understand why I didn't return the money, but I don't understand how you can say you were being transparent in that interaction. And I can't understand how you can say you're being transparent where for the last two weeks, you guys have known this extra information and have not given it out. Why has it not been supplied to families? Why didn't anybody email me back on this board and say, look, we actually do have a need now. This is the need. So I'm really just sort of confused by, by, by that. I feel that everything should be transparent, especially anything having to do with money and asking for donations. So I have a few questions that you could decide to answer or not or email me separately or whatever you want to do. Um, and since I'm trying to understand, you've had $500,000 or you've had, you've had money that you've earmarked through the, the digital divide, $500,000 for computers, but you now say that you need more computers because you were asked for more over the weekend. And is that money now being used from these donations? 
what's the name of the donation fund? Will we get regular updates as to how much, how often you're using, how you need this funding, when it gets low, when it gets high? Um, why isn't it going through the Board of Education Foundation, which is specifically a group tar trying to target helping these these things that happen kind of outside of normal everyday situations. Um, I'm just, I'm, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm really quite upset and disappointed. Um, I feel like I was, I feel like it's really important to be clear, both in writing and, you know, wherever else. And I'd like to feel like that the board also agrees with all of that and that we can have greater transparency going forward. And that when you say you need money, well, you've seen it, you'll get your money. But if you don't need the money at a particular time and saying that you do, that's a problem for me. I don't know if it's a problem for other people. And when you say that you now need the money, it needs to be just said outright. We now need money. This is how much we need. Can you help us? And then the township will be there. So that's what's important about understanding about all these Chromebooks and the donations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Judith. Is there anyone else that's interested in speaking? I have a second hand for Akash. I would love to be interested in speaking again. Okay. Yeah. Is it on something different, Akash? Because it, it is on something we, different. Is there is anyone, uh, hold on for a second. David, does anyone else have their hand up? No, they do not. Okay, go ahead, Akash. It is something different. I would love to give you the news that we have good news in our South Brunswick High School. 15 South Brunswick students are now National Merit semifinalists. They are members of South Brunswick High School Class of 2021. The people who are semifinalists are Adrian Gasper, Akash, Jane, Jane Mehar, Johal, Vandita Krishnan, Aditya Magesh Kumar, Nandita Nagarajan, Saisha Noguru, Jeffrey Paul Raj, Vikran Pulipati, Adi Rain, Neil Shah, Pranavan Sri Ranganathan, Saurav Suresh, Shriya Vopula, and Ivan Vang. So I, congratulations to all of them. Hope you guys congratulate them when you see them in person. Thank you, Akash. Thank and this you, is from Akash. I just got to know today and I hope you are all proud. I love you all, and I hope you do wonderful things in the near future. This is from Akash. Thank you. Thank you, Akash. No Anybody problem. Anybody else have their hands up? No, they do not. Okay. Seeing none, uh, can I get a motion to close the public portion, please? Motion to close. Uh, moved by Ray, uh, Ray Keener. I have a second. Second, second by Joe Scalette. Thank you. Uh, moving along, uh, board committee reports. Anybody, uh, any chairman from uh, the last meeting that had a, a, a committee and now has minutes, uh, uh, please uh, give us. Uh, yes, Mr. President, I do have you, the curriculum community. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. So. Curriculum committee met on August 27th, right before board last board meeting, and mostly covered by Mr. Feder at the uh, during his report. But I'll just go uh, very briefly. So Jan gave us an update on uh, virtual learning, how to uh, reopen the school, and then he, she did mention that there was about 90 families signed up for the remote learning, and she did talk about S SLE learning and uh, and district have all the informations on the district website. And also, Jen uh, will give us a gizmo and other applications, uh, or other apps uh, demo during next, uh, maybe oct end of September or October board meeting so that we can all see how students are interacting with all the, uh, all the other apps and working out like labs and everything else. And we did approve the five-year curriculum uh, cycle for, uh, during last board meeting. And uh, the, the usually, and that's I think, and then three alumni uh, met with, uh, students uh, met with Jan uh, on uh, social justice and uh, and regarding our curriculum. That also those students spoke at, during our last board meetings. So that's about it. Uh, I'm 
uh, unless anyone else uh, has any comments or anything else from my committee, uh, my committee members are Lisa Rogers, Joyce Mehta, and uh, Jen is heading a whole committee. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Uh, move along. Can I get a motion uh, on the approving the consent agenda for this evening? Motion. Who was that? Oh, Dr. Yeah. Parker. Moved by Dr. Parker, second by Mr. Patel. All in favor? Aye. 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 Roll call. Can I get roll call, please? Patrick Del Piano. Yes. Mr. Raymond Keener. Yes. Mrs. Joyce Mehta. Yes. Dr. Stephen Parker. Yes. Mr. Devin Patel. Aye. Mr. Arthur Robinson. Yes. Mrs. Lisa Rogers. Yes. Mr. Barry, or excuse me, Mr. Joseph Scaletti. Yes. Mr. Barry Nathanson. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Board comments and communication. Anyone have any comments? Please raise your hand. Nothing. Wow. Okay, real quick. I want to wish uh, Ray and Laura Keener a very happy 37 year anniversary. So, uh, so. Thank you. Yep. And uh, uh, this being a meeting before uh, the G G Rosh Hashanah, I want to wish everybody uh, a happy new year. Uh, and uh, a sweet new year. So uh, in Hebrew, it's Lashana Tova. Thank you. And moving along, we're going into executive session. Be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Township of South Brunswick hereby moves to go into executive session in accordance with the Sunshine Law, Chapter 231 of Public Laws of 1975. NJSA 10 colon 4 dash 6 through 10 colon 4 dash 21 to discuss the following. It's to discuss personnel and negotiations. Be it resolved, be it further resolved that the discussion uh, conduct in executive session can be disclosed to the public at such time as the matters have been resolved formal action may be taken at any meeting. Uh, I want to, uh, can I get a motion to clo uh, close the uh, meeting? Moved by Lisa Rogers, do I have a second? Second. Second by Ray Keener. Uh, good night, South Brunswick, and please stay safe.